Good morning, church family. It's good to see all of you again on the Lord's Day. I want to thank the Lord for several people, all of you in general, but I want to thank the Lord for Pastor Corey, Pastor Vladimir, Pastor Ed. Uh, the last several weeks has been a project in preaching regarding the Apostles' Creed. And going through that was not very easy in some areas, but the goal was to unite the church in truth, in a historical confession, in creed. And so we want to unite brothers and sisters around the Lord's table, those who are brothers and sisters in Christ. So I'm just grateful to God for them. I know they don't want to hear this, but I'm just grateful to God for you. So let me pray and we'll get started. Father, we're grateful for this time that you've given us. You're our only God. You're our sovereign King and Lord. Father, who do we have in heaven but you? So we ask you, Lord, to bless us with your Holy Spirit, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that our heart and our affections and our minds and our wills would be captivated by the glory of Christ today. So help your servant, O oh God, to be faithful to your word. You are worthy. In Christ we pray. Amen. In the 1500s, there was a Japanese warlord by the name of Hideyoshi. Hideyoshi was commissioned by the emperor or the king at that time to build a massive statue of Buddha. And he built this massive statue of Buddha over five years and it had taken 50,000 men to build this statue. And at the end of this time, right as this statue was nearly completed, a massive earthquake in 1596 hit the city of Kyoto, Japan. And this massive Buddha was in this shrine, and this earthquake, earthquake was so massive that it took the roof and it crushed this statue and all this work that these people had done over many, many years. And in rage, Hideyoshi said this, Quote, I put you here, great Buddha, at great expense, and you can't even look after your own temple. What can we learn from that? There's three things we can learn from this statement. Number one, every person is serving gods in this life. If you're a true born-again Christian, you're serving the true and living God. But if you're not a Christian, then you are serving God. A God, small g, not the true and living God, but you are serving a God if you're not a Christian. Number two, every person is transformed into the image of his God. Whatever is in your heart, whatever you want, whatever you desire, whoever you want to serve, it's already in your heart, and it's just a matter of time before what's in your heart comes out of your heart, and you're transformed into the image of this false God. Number three, mankind creates and forms a structure of society in its own image. In other words, every culture and every nation and every geopolitical country around the world forms their structure and creates their structure of society in its own image. This is what we want. We want a king just like the other pagan nations. And with that statement, they're denying and rejecting their own living God and creator, the people of Israel. So what, were, what are we talking about? In today's text, in Deuteronomy 8, verses 11 through 20, it's entitled, Remember Your God. We're really dealing with idol worship today. Idol worship. And the main point is this. Many times, not all the time, but many times, financial blessings and prosperity leads to spiritual amnesia. It leads to spiritual amnesia. If we were to be very honest with ourselves today and evaluate what's in our heart, and evaluate how we live our lives before the living God who created you and me and saved you and I from his holy wrath and judgment, we would be honest and say, we have spiritual amnesia many times. And the background to our text today is this. 
that Deuteronomy is really a repeating of God's law in the history of Israel. This was written before uh, Moses' death in 1406 B.C. And when we think about the storyline, creation, God created. Genesis 3, the fall of mankind through Adam, the federal head of humanity. He sinned and plunged the entire human race into sin and depravity. And the whole human race is guilty of sin. And then we think about redemption. Will God leave his people in their sin and be judged and cast into hell for all of eternity? Yet in God's kindness, God saves his people still. He saves his people and he's leading them to a place, a very specific place. So in this storyline, Israel is at the Jordan. They're about to cross over the Jordan. It is Joshua who will lead Israel into the promised land, the land that God promised to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses has been with God's people since the beginning, but yet Moses will not enter the, mo the promised land. Why? Because of his own sin. Moses contends with the Lord and pleads with the Lord to let him into the land in Numbers 27, but God does not allow it because of his sin. And what we're dealing with today in these verses in 11 through 20, really the whole chapter 8, is really Moses' farewell address to Israel. He explains to the people who you are. Don't forget who you are. You're not like any of the ites, the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Jebusites. You are God's people by God's grace. Don't forget that. That's number one. But number two, what they're to do and not do. What they're to do and not do. But in order to understand today's text, we need to understand what's the goal. What's the destination? If we look at verse 7, it says this, Deuteronomy 8. Verse 7, for the Lord your God is bringing you, you all, into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, trees, and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And you shall eat and be full. And you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. So the Lord is leading his people. A very specific group of people into a very specific area. Into the promised land. If a group of people is going to survive and live and flourish... There's two basic necessities. They need food and they need water. Food and water is basic to any flourishment of any culture and society. But when we think about what we just read, this is a land that has much more than just basic water and food. This is a land that has plentiful water. It has fountains. It has springs. Can you imagine going up to a spring or to a river and drinking the water fresh from your hand or from your mouth. We live in Las Vegas, so water is a commodity. It's a precious commodity. But most of us don't want to drink water straight out of the tap. Why? Many times because we don't want to glow at night because of the possible nuclear filaments that are in the water. We drink bottled water. But we're talking about a water that's pure, a land that has pure, clean, fresh refreshing water. It also has wheat and barley. Think about making the best recipes and the best bread and the best cupcakes. You have food. You have fig trees and pomegranates. You have olive trees and honey. You have food without GMO. You have food without toxins. You have food without pesticides. And also this land has precious metals has iron and copper. These are needed items if you're going to go to war and you're going to build items and build weapons. 
This land is abundant in everything. It lacks nothing. It has everything in place for a culture and a society and a people group to live and to flourish. It's a lush and fertile land. And when we think about this, God is leading his people into a very specific area, the promised land. And he's not going to just let them be in the land by themselves. God is actually going to be with his people in that land. Doesn't this sound almost like the Garden of Eden? That God is in a perfect place on earth with people, his people. Sounds like the Garden of Eden. Let me read Revelation 21. One again, and I know Brother Jose read this, but I think it's good for us to read it again. It says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. According to the Jewish mind and Jewish tradition and culture, the sea was a very chaotic place. The sea is not a place where it would expound thoughts of peace and joy. And now in the new heaven or the new Jerusalem, there is no more sea. What is the idea here? The idea is no more sin, no more chaos. It's a perfect place. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. See, that is one of the main themes that start from the beginning of the Bible, throughout the Bible, and even now to Revelation 21. God has promised, I will save my people, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God has said that. God has promised that. God will make that happen. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself with them as their God. What kind of God are we dealing with? We're dealing with God who is sovereign, God who is holy, God who hates sin, and yet in his grace and his love and his mercy, he takes wicked sinners, plunges them out of the muck, and the mire, and he dusts them off and cleans them off with the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ. And he brings them not just to any land. He brings them to the promised land. He brings them to the new Jerusalem, and they will be his people, and God will be their God. That's where we're going in the history of humanity. This is where no matter what happens in the world, whether we go to war with China or not, God is leading his people. He's directing human history exactly where it's going to be, where he has decreed it from all of eternity. Nothing and no one is going to stop him, and he will receive all glory when he brings each and every one of us home. That's the God that we worship and adore. So when we think of Deuteronomy 8 now, in the wilderness, God provided manna for the people. But now in the promised land, the people will eat bread without scarcity to the full. If they want to eat bread eight hours a day, they can eat bread all day. But here's the reality, that this manna, nobody knows exactly what kind of bread this is. Why? Because it's a supernatural phenomena. Mankind, God's people, were making bread before the wilderness. But now that God's people are in the wilderness and they're complaining about their bellies not being full and God provided manna out of grace for the people, but this is manna, a special type of bread for a special group of people at a special time and place. So nobody knows exactly what kind of bread this is, but we know this. They're going to eat and eat and eat and be satisfied. The land 
was promised by God to Abraham. It came to Abraham in the form of a covenant. And it's to Abraham's seed and descendants. If you want to write down scripture references, I'll say it right now real quick. It's Genesis 17, verse 2. Genesis 17, verse 2. Verse 4. Verse 7. Verse 9. Verse 13. 19. And 21. Again, Genesis chapter 7, verse 2. Verse 4, verse 7, verse 9, verse 13, verse 19, verse 21. I know I said that fast. God makes a covenant with Abraham. And the covenant is God's promise to Abraham to make him the father of a multitude of nations. That Abraham, out of his loins or out of his lineage or out of his descendants, there will be many more descendants and many more seeds, so to speak. And there will be kings that come out of that line. Ultimately, that's fulfilled in Christ. Jesus is the one with descendants from every nation because of the gospel of grace in Christ. So we're dealing with not something that's just physical. We're dealing with something greater than physical that's spiritual. And so this Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled in Christ. Christ is the one who has descendants from every people group in the world. This physical land that they're going into is a real land. But it's not the ultimate fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. The Abrahamic promise is ultimately fulfilled in Christ. In other words, the promise of land is not fulfilled in a physical land. The promise of land is ultimately fulfilled in Christ. So when we read of land promises in the Bible, the ultimate fulfillment of those land promises is in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has come to save his people from every tribe and tongue and nation and people group. If you take that literally, then you're confined to a land stretch of 60 miles long, north and south, by 30 miles east and west wide. God is greater than that. God will save his people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So when we think about this Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18, it says this, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. God has promised Abraham a physical land in this context. And it stretches from Egypt all the way to the Euphrates. Genesis 17, 8 says this, And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings. Which land? All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. So there's a connection between land, God, and God's people. All of those are connected. So the theme of land runs through the entire Bible. God promised to bring his people into a good land. Not just any land, but a good land. And God has promised to be their God, and Israel will be God's people. So God is faithful. When God makes a promise, especially in the form of a covenant, God is always faithful. God is always faithful. Let me say that one more time. God is always faithful. The problem is never God. The problem is you and me. The problem is humanity. We are very good at being unfaithful. Yet God is always faithful. He's always faithful. Exodus 34, 11 says this, Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you 
the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. This is the Lord speaking to God's people. The Lord says, you're going into a land where there's a lot of pagan idol worship. There's all these people groups. But don't worry. I'm going to drive them out. God is the warrior. God is the victor. And he goes on to say, take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go. Lest they become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break down their pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall worship no other god. For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice and you take of their daughters for your sons and for their daughters. Whore after their gods and make your sons whore after their gods. Many people read texts like this and they say, that's very unloving and unkind of God to destroy a people or kill off a people. According to who? Who are we to judge who God is? Who are we? To command of God what he shall and shall not do. God is God. And everything he does is good and right. His ways are higher than our ways. And when the Lord deals with a people group like this, it's not because of their political affiliation, so to speak. It's really a matter of worship. Who are these people and who do they worship? If they worship false gods, that's idol worship and that's detestable and an abomination to the Lord. And because God is creator and God is redeemer and God is sovereign, that's offensive to the living God. God has every right to demand what he desires. And so during this time frame, the land was inhabited by these sinful and wicked people. And so to go into a land and take their sons as husbands or to take their daughters as wives or to partake in their festivals of their gods is a snare and a trap to God's people. They will worship false gods. They will commit idol worship. And if you remember the language of what I just read, the Bible's very clear and very blunt and very direct that those who worship false idols, dead gods, are whores. They prostituted themselves to worship a God who cannot save them and cannot forgive them of their sins. Some people say, well, it's not right for God to be jealous because the Bible says we're not to be jealous or covet. Well, when we take the word jealousy and apply it to sinful humanity, it is a sin. It's a sinful desire. It's sinful discontent. But when we take that same word jealous and we apply it to the holy, living, perfect God, it means something much different. This is what it means. It means that God created humanity. God created his people. And he saved his people and redeemed his people. Therefore, he has every right to demand from them how they shall live in honor God. So we can't take that word and apply it in the same way. What's interesting is when God's people go into the land, they're to do something very specific. This is in verse 10. Once they go into the land and take possession of the land... They are required to bless Yahweh, their God, for the good land he has given them. In other words, they are to be grateful. They are to be thankful. They are to be humble. Why? Because when God makes a promise and fulfills it, that should cause in the heart of God's people great awe and respect and honor for God. That God cares for me. That God loves me. That God has provided for me. That he promised to me and my family and to the patriarchs before us. And yet much time has elapsed, but yet God is still faithful. 
doesn't matter how much time has passed. God is still faithful. God doesn't operate on our time frame. God operates on his time frame, which is perfect. And so this verse in verse 10 is the basis for the Jewish practice of blessing or thankfulness. So if you wonder why Jews thank God before a meal or thank God after a meal or thank God for just about anything, it's because of this verse. They're called to bless the Lord because God has blessed them. And we do that to a certain extent, do we not? We're about to partake of a meal here in a few minutes. And we're going to thank the Lord for this meal. Why should we thank the Lord? It's because there are many people in Las Vegas and around the world that cannot eat food right now. We have no room to complain. God has given us everything we need. God has not given us everything we want. But God has given us everything that we need. And it is enough. So God's people are to bless the Lord. Side note. Dear Christian brother and sister, what are you thankful for? What are you grateful for? Are you the type of person that loves to just take, 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 receive, receive, receive? It's all about me. Me, me, me. You don't thank the people who pray for you. You don't thank the people who bless you. You don't thank the people who's helped you. And you definitely don't thank the Lord. What are you thankful for? Because the psalmist says in Psalm 30, verse 12, O Lord, my God, O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. I will give you thanks forever. We need to be more like the psalmist. That no matter what blessing God gives us, big or small, we bless the Lord. Let me say it like this. Anything short of hell and judgment is God's mercy. And we should be thankful we should be thankful for what God has given us. He's given us Christ. The greatest gift that we could ever receive in this life. Forgiveness by the holy living God through Christ. We should be a thankful people. Because in general, thankful people are humble people. Thankful people are humble people. What was Moses' great concern? as this is written. What is his great concern? It's this, that Israel will forget their God. Israel will forget their God. Look at verse 11. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when you are Herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. Then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and my might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. So what is Moses doing? Moses is instructing God's people who they are and what they are to do and not do. God's people are to be attentive. They're to be focused. Otherwise, they're they are going to forget their living God and Lord when they take possession of the land. And why will Israel forget God? The text is very clear. It's financial blessing. 
its material blessing. Verse 12 says, eat and be full, build houses and live in them. They're going to eat like they never have eaten before, and they're going to be full. They're going to have resources where they can eat all the time. Not only are they going to build good houses and live in good houses, when God dispossesses those false nations, when God dispossesses them, they're going to live in houses that are already built, that are already good. It doesn't require any work or any effort or any sacrifice. They're going to live in houses that other people built. And then when we look at verse 13, herds and flocks, silver and gold, everything they have will be multiplied. And yet the Bible states that God owns it all. See, the problem for most people especially the time of Israel and for our time today is this, is that we forget, we forget that God owns it all. We forget. We are simply stewards of what God has given. You may own a house and the title is in your name and you have a piece of paper that says paid in full. That house doesn't belong to you if you're a Christian. In the ultimate sense, God owns it all. God owns your bank account. God owns your life. God owns your family and your marriage. God owns it all. We are simply stewards, and we're to manage all of these resources for the glory of God, to extend his kingdom, to bring glory and praise to his name. That's what we're called to do. Job 41, 11 says this, Who has first given to me that I should repay him? God asks a rhetorical question here. Do I owe you anything? And here's the answer. Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. The psalmist says in verse 50, verse 10, chapter 50, verse 10, For every beast of the forest is mine. Even the cattle on a thousand hills. God owns it all. God owns it all. God is sovereign. God is the legal owner of all. And when we fast forward and we think about what Israel is doing or about to do, that they're going to forget their God, how do they forget their God? It's by what they focus on. What they focus on and who they worship is how they forget God. What they focus on and who they worship is how they forget God. So when we think about time and money, we usually say things like this. It's my time, my money, this is what I'm going to do. But if you're a Christian and you understand that God owns it all, you say that God owns the time that he's loaned to me. And God owns these financial resources, and they're loaned to me, and I'm supposed to steward them. Because time and money is simply a reflection of the human heart. You want to know which God you serve? Open up your checkbook. There's an old so Southern Baptist joke that said, if you shoot Southern Baptists in their wallet, they'll die. Why? Because that's their God. Nobody wants anybody to touch their money and their time. But time and money is simply a reflection of the human heart. So when we think about what is happening here, when we connect verse 14 and verse 17 together, there's a deep connection between forgetting God and pride, human pride. We end up with forgetting God is deeply connected of forgetting his great salvation and redemption in Christ. Those two are connected. 
So if you forget God and I forget God, it's because we're prideful people. We forget what God has done for us in Christ. So, question for us. How do we spend our time and our money? Here's a better question. How do we spend God's time and God's money? How are you extending His kingdom? How are you bringing glory to His name? Are we any different than Israel when it comes to time and money? I would argue no. We're not any different than them. We focus a lot of time, money, and energy on things that we want. But again, the Lord owns it all. When Israel does not intentionally remember their God, this is what happens in verse 14. Then Israel's heart will be exalted or proud or lifted up or exalted up. Normally what happens is when we lift ourselves up in pride, we automatically take the Lord off of the throne and bring him down. You can't have two kings on one throne. There's only one person that sits on the throne, and the rightful person is the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, when we look at verse 14, Israel is going to forget something else. They're going to forget God's mighty act of redemption. Israel is the one who was entrapped or enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt. So who is the one that can take them out of Egypt? Who is the one who can take them out of slavery? Who is the one that has more power than Pharaoh? Who is the one that has more political clout than Pharaoh? Who is the one that has more authority and perfect authority than Pharaoh? It's God. It's the Lord. Proud people forget God's redemption. Proud people forget God's redemption. The only answer to an enslaved people to be freed and redeemed is God Almighty. That's the answer. There's no way for Israel to be free unless God steps in and intervenes. It is the Lord himself by his great power and might. However, God's people, we suffer from a very real disease. It's called short-term memory loss. We suffer from forgetfulness. And forgetfulness leads to spiritual amnesia. We forget the goodness of God for us and towards us. We forget what he's done for us in Christ. We forget our Savior and our Redeemer. Let me say it a little bit more clear. To forget God is to to have an ungodly lifestyle. To forget God is to have an ungodly lifestyle. Let me say it like this. To live with little or no conscious thought of God or of God's will or of God's glory or our dependence upon God or our responsibility to God is 100% certified ungodliness. How many of us do this? That we live our day-to-day life with no conscious thought of our gracious, kind, and living Lord. We don't think about His glory as we ought. We don't think about our responsibility to God because He saved you. We think about ourselves. Are we not good at thinking about ourselves? Are we not good at loving ourselves? We're very good. The Bible presupposes that. So we're dealing with pride. That's what we're dealing with. The reason that God's people worship false gods is because of pride. Ungodliness leads to pride. No thought of God? Okay, automatically we lift ourselves up. But we need to be reminded of this in Deuteronomy 8. Verse 17, beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. See, that's what ungodliness does. Ungodliness leads to prideful thinking. 
and prideful living. There's no thankfulness at all to God for these blessings. Pride is all about self. Pride is all about me. Of course, we can make our conscience appeased and assuage. We come here on a Sunday morning on the Lord's Day. But what happens when we leave these doors? Daniel 4, verse 30. Daniel 4, verse 30. Talks about Nebuchadnezzar. If you remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar, he built this great empire. And one day or one night, he's on the rooftop of his palace. And he looks over the entire landscape of his great kingdom. And he says this. Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? What is Nebuchadnezzar saying? He goes, look at all this, and it's because of me. No thankfulness to God at all. And God judged him immediately. As soon as those words came out of his mouth, God judged him immediately. And when you read the rest of that story, I'm thinking to myself, God is gracious, Nebuchadnezzar. Because God has every right to strike down Nebuchadnezzar right on the spot with a lightning bolt from heaven. And yet, God lets him live. That's the grace of God. So ungodliness leads to pride. And pride says, look at me. But in Deuteronomy 8, verse 18... Moses says this, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. Yes, did Israel work together to garner and gather resources? Yes, they worked. They had a physical responsibility to do so. But we cannot confuse this with the Lord who is sovereign. The Lord is the one who ultimately gives the power to get wealth. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed that those who are part of the health, wealth, and prosperity groups, they focus on the gift rather than the giver of the gift nine out of ten times? There's no thankfulness to God. There's no remembering of what God has done for them in Christ. There's no statements about God has every right to judge me for my sin, and yet in God's grace, he saved me. He gave me a new heart that loves Christ. Proverbs 16, 18 says this, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride always happens first before judgment. So Moses warns Israel, don't forget God. Remember the Lord, your God. Remember Yahweh who created you, who saved you, who redeemed you. He brought you out by a mighty hand. He overthrew the entire Egyptian government and Pharaoh. You were hungry, he gave you food. You were thirsty, he gave you water. And now you're at the border of crossing the Jordan into the promised land. God has been with his people every step of the way. And Moses warns them, don't forget God. Because once you go into the land, there will be plenty. There will be an abundance. There will be financial and material blessings that you haven't seen in a while. Don't forget your God. Moses also reteaches them a history lesson. Can God actually provide in the wilderness? Can God actually provide miracles in the wilderness? Yes. Yes. Think about this. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. And if you read the previous verses, that their their chinilas or their chanclas or their Birkenstocks never faded, never were ruined, never were broken. God provided sandals. God provided clothing that never worn out for 40 whole years. Some of us can't, Go a week without buying more clothes. And God provides in such a way. Imagine walking for 40 years. I can't even think of walking for 40 minutes. 
but they walked for 40 years, and God said, your feet didn't even swell. That's the kindness of God. And God led them through the wilderness for 40 years. It says, with fiery serpents and scorpions. Some take this as a figure of speech. Metonymy. Meaning that this is a picture of the result of sin. But I respectfully disagree. I think the natural read, reading of this, when we consider Numbers 21. Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. That there is salvation through judgment. There is salvation on the other side of judgment. This is God's grace. God's people, they, it says that they were complaining about the food and the water. They actually said, this is worthless food. Wow. How dishonoring and disrespectful and blasphemous, blasphemous to God. God provided food, and they said, we don't even like this worthless food. God should have killed them all. He had every right to do so. And yet God, in his kindness, sent serpents that bit the people, and many of them died. But those who lived and survived, God provided grace to them. How? That they would lift up a bronze serpent. And those who looked would live. This is not saying that Jesus Christ is a bronze serpent. This is not about the serpent being lifted up. This is about Jesus lifted up on a cross. And so those who look to Jesus are saved. They're forgiven by God. The God's people, they walk through a parched, dry ground, no water, can you think of, think of this? You go to a place and you don't know where your next drink of water is going to come from. And yet God provided in a supernatural way from a supernatural supply that can only come from a supernatural God, the living God. They were hungry and God provided manna. God provided food. And why did God allow his people to be hungry? Could God have fed them before their hunger pains hit their belly, of course God could have fed them. But the text is clear. It's to test them. To see what was in their heart. To do them good. God tests his people. God does not tempt his people, according to James chapter 1. God is not the author of sin. God does not tempt his people, but God tests his people. And God doesn't test people because he doesn't know what's in their heart. Of course, God is the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-present God. God knows exactly what's in each and every person's heart. This is not about God knowing what's in the heart. This is actually a matter of Israel knowing what's in their heart. God is revealing Israel's sin to Israel. And so God allowed them to be hungry. God tested them. It was for their good. They are to learn to wait upon God. There's more to life than physical food. There's more to life than physical blessing. There's more to life than financial blessings. God's people are to wait upon God as their Lord. As a matter of fact, God's people are to live not by physical bread alone, but by every word, every word that comes from the mouth of God. God's people are to live by the authoritative word of God, the inspired word of God. But now, I want to put some feet to this sermon. How are we to live before God? How are we not to forget God? Verse 11. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Look at verse 1 of Deuteronomy 8. 
the whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do. Look at the first half of verse 2 in Deuteronomy 8. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Verse 6, so you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. So when you think about all this biblical language of commandments, rules, and statutes, in general, we're talking about the law of God. To be very specific, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. And if we understand how the law works, then we don't look at the law as legalism. If you understand, and if we understand how the law works, we don't look at it as legalism. We don't obey the law of God in order to be forgiven. That's the point. There's no human being that can obey the law of God perfectly except Jesus Christ. So we don't look at the law as legalism. So how does the law work? How does the law work? And you see in your bulletin the threefold use of the law. The threefold use of the law. The first purpose of the law is a mirror. We understand what a mirror is, right? We wake up in the morning. The first thing we do before we brush our teeth, at least for most people, is we look at what damage has been done through the night, right? So the first purpose of the law is a mirror. It reflects God's holiness. It shows us who God is, that he is holy. But it also reflects who we are as humanity. We are sinful to the core. We are sinful to the core. So the law of God reveals or mirrors God's holiness and righteousness and man's sinfulness and wickedness. The second purpose of the law is to restrain. It's like a curb. It directs or restrains evil. The law cannot change the human heart. Only God can. The law cannot change your heart nor mine. Only God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can change sinful hearts. However, the law protects the righteous from the unrighteous. In other words, in this life, there is limited justice. I didn't say perfect justice. And I didn't say full justice. In this life, there is limited justice justice. There's times where we have good judges and they judge properly and correctly. There's times where we have bad judges and they judge badly. But the purpose, second purpose of the law is to restrain evil, to protect the righteous from the unrighteous. And when the Lord Jesus comes back a second time, he will judge perfectly at that time. He will judge perfectly. The third purpose of the law is to reveal, to reveal what is pleasing to God. So we have a mirror, we have a curb, and I call the third use of the law the spotlight. It reveals what is pleasing to God. It's amazing when people say, I don't believe in using the law in my Christian life. Well, what they're actually saying is they're a secret antinomianist. They're saying that the law of God has no purpose, no benefit, so I'm going to discard the law of God completely. Well, how are you going to honor the Lord in that way? Because now the standard of holy living is your own personal feelings. So when we think about the law of God, we seek to serve the Lord. We want to honor the Lord. But how are you going to honor the Lord if you throw the law of God out the window? You can say, well, I know murder is wrong. Taking of innocent life is wrong. Well, how do you know that? I know envy and jealousy is wrong and sinful. Well, how do you know that? I know that disrespecting my father and my mother is sinful. Well, how do you know that? I know that idol worship, worshiping false gods, is sinful and wicked. Well, how do you know that? The third purpose of the law is a spotlight. 
It reveals to us what is pleasing to God. We are not obeying the law of God to be justified or forgiven by God. But because we are justified by God in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then guess what? We obey the law of God because we don't look at it as a burden any longer. We look at it as a way to live a life that is holy and pleasing to God. That's why I said earlier, it's not legalism if you understand the law properly. So the law is used as a mirror, a curb, and a spotlight. Also, Jesus says if he wanted to, but he didn't, if he was going to overthrow the entire Ten Commandments, he could have said it in John chapter 14, but he didn't. In John chapter 14, verse 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my what? Commandments. This is not enough to overthrow the use of God's law in an honoring way to God. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So when we consider the third use of the law, this is the idea behind Moses' final address to Israel. Israel, you are God's people. This is how you're to live, to honor God, to live a life that's pleasing to God, to give Him glory. How? By obeying the law, by keeping God's commandments, rules, and statutes. It's not a way to get justified, but because you are justified, this is what's pleasing to God. So this is not about being forgiven, but this is all about once you are forgiven, how, you, how we are to live before the Lord. In ex Exodus 34, verse 28, Moses wrote the Ten Commandments. And in Deuteronomy 4, verse 13, Moses was to teach God's commandments, rules, and statutes to the people before they go over the Jordan. Why? Because of idol worship that's coming up. But when we think about this, in Exodus 13, God uses Moses to depart from Egypt. It's known as the Exodus, right? To depart. Depart from what? Depart from the house of slavery. Slavery. To depart from Egypt. This is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ because Jesus is the true Moses. Deuteronomy 18.15. I don't have time to go into this. But if you're taking notes, you'll want to write that down. Deuteronomy 18.15 and Luke 9.31. Luke 9.31. Luke 9.31 says this, Who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. This is talking about Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. And it's talking about Jesus and his departure. Now, when we look at the word departure, that literally means exodus. Jesus' departure is Jesus' exodus. But when we think about this, this departure is not coming out of Egypt, but this departure comes in the form of Christ's death on behalf of God's people. That through the death of Jesus, sinners who place their faith in Christ are forgiven. That's the ultimate departure. They're forgiven by God of all their sins through the departure or the death of Christ by faith in him. So the first Moses did not die for God's people. The second Moses did. The first Moses didn't lead God's people into the promised land. Why? Because of his sin. But the second Moses is perfect with no sin, and he leads his people all the way to the promised land. And I would take that a step further. He's going to bring his people all the way home. So if you're not a Christian, please hear me out. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. Are you playing around with the things of Christ? You need, to take about, you need to take the word of God seriously and where you stand before the Lord. You could die tonight. I'm not trying to scare you, but if it scares you to run to Christ, then good. But what are you doing 
regarding this great salvation that's found in Christ. See, because if you're not a Christian and you, and you understand the law, you can't accomplish the law. You can't satisfy the law. You can't even obey the law on your best religious day. You need God's help to take this law and to drive you to Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the law, is that you would see your sinfulness and you would see God's holiness and you would cry out to God for God's grace in Jesus Christ. So if that's you, you need to run to Christ. You need to turn to Christ. You need to put your hope in Christ and quit playing around with the things of Christ. Salvation only comes from the Lord. Run to Christ while there's still salvation. Because there's a day that's coming where salvation is no longer offered. It's only judgment at that time. I, I, I wish I could somehow explain it in a better way. That we need Christ and you need Christ. You need the salvation that can only come from the Lord. In the late 1800s, there's a great hymn that was penned. It's number 644 in our Red Baptist hymnal. It's called Count Your Blessings, but stanza number two says this. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings. Money cannot buy. Your reward in heaven, nor your home on high. And then the chorus goes like this. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God hath done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. You want to remember the Lord? Remember his law in a right way. Remember what God has done for you in Christ. Remember what you deserve and yet God didn't give you what you deserve. He gave you mercy. He gave you grace. He gave you his love in Christ. So remember your God. And when we remember what we deserve and we contemplate God's grace in Christ Jesus, we will remember our God. When Christians remember God's gracious pur purpose in his commandments, rules and statutes. We will remember our God. And we need to remember this. I said it once. I'll say it again. Anything short of God's judgment and hell is mercy to you and to me. That's, that's God's mercy. And every blessing that we have in this life doesn't originate from us, but every blessing in this life originates in the goodness of God in the goodness of our God. And if we forget this, we will sin and sin and sin and dishonor our Lord and our God. So sermon in a sentence. Intentionally remember your God by living and keeping every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you're going to remember God, you need to be intentional about remembering God. God is good, and God is kind, and God is faithful. And when we sin, repent, trust in the Lord again, and he will forgive. Let's pray.